All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Libby Gill, who is in lovely Los Angeles. How are you doing, Libby? I'm good. Thanks, John. And I'm down here in San Diego and we're celebrating dry days. And I know that really annoys everybody in the rest of the world when we complain about weather down here. But, you know, it's fun. Um, okay, well, uh, Libby's founder and CEO of the executive con- coaching and consulting firm, Libby Gill and & Company, and she's the former head of communications at Sony Universal and Turner Broadcasting, international speaker and best-selling author, authored a number of books. And today we want to talk about leadership, and your, your last book was uh, The Hope Driven Leader, correct? That right. is right. Yeah. So tell me uh, a bit about what do you mean by a hope driven leader? You know, in in my life, I always felt like hope was the the kind of the jet fuel for what gets you past challenges. It gets you up in the morning. And then as I I worked in the entertainment community for a lot of years and then got to the point where I felt like, gee, I've, I've done everything I wanted to do. Let's move on. And what always fascinated me was was building and developing a team. And so I jumped into coaching. It's now more years later than I care to admit, but a long time I've been doing this. And I was in my research and reading, I discovered the science of hopefulness, that in fact, there's a body of research that comes out of medicine and positive psychology. And it's really about being willing to participate in this future focused vision, having that that absolute clarity of the future, but also being willing to link the beliefs and the behaviors that will get you there. Right. No, and, that, that's really fascinating. So so basically what you're saying, I mean, obviously you have to actively participate, like hope, you can't just sit back and hope. But if you're actively participating and doing all the right things, but you combine that with a, a hope and a belief, uh, in success, then that's a that's a powerful combination. Well, it, and there's actually some components from the two real pioneers of this hope theory. And if you go back to your you know, college psychology and remember Dr. Viktor Frankl, who yeah. was a, a sure. Viennese psychiatrist who survived not one but two of the most notorious Nazi death camps, and he came out with this renewed vision of. What was the experience? What did I learn from this horrible experience? And it was this search for meaning. And so, two of the pioneers, one from from medicine and one from psychology, looked at hope. And the first one was a doctor, a doctor of psychology from the University of Kansas. And he was on sabbatical and said, "I'm going to go study up on you know hope. I'm going to get all the research and the academics." He went to his college library, and there was nothing. And he realized, as as a good social scientist, it's because people assumed it was not measurable. So he measured it. He created a scale called the Adult Situational Hope Scale. And I was able to recreate that in my book with permission of his estate. And it really looks at, do you have a vision of the future? Do you believe that your actions drive the outcomes? It's, it's all these pieces of sort of the things we know, but often we think, oh, that, that it's too lofty, it's too ambitious, or I don't know how to chunk it down. I could never get there. And he said it's about willpower, but also about way power, which mm-hmm. is these multiple pathways that you can take. You know, in today's age, it's not like we're working an assembly line. It's there are lots of ways to the end goal. I mean, look at what you do. Entrepreneurs have to find all different methods to, you know, to, to take their madness into reality. Yeah. And and the point that you make there, number one, it's a fascinating point. The fact that there was no body of work there because nobody thought hope was a. Um, with something measurable. But second off is, as you say, when you're in a situation, whether it's entrepreneurial or whatever, sometimes hope and belief, it's, sometimes it seems like it's the only thing you have that can continue to drive you forward and get you out of bed to find those solutions. Well, I was one of those kids that grew up with um, a, a, a truly dysfunctional and often tragic family. I, I had the death of half a dozen of my relatives. By the time I was 30, I'd lost all my grandparents and two brothers. And um, and then my parents divorced, alcoholism, uh, my stepmother committed suicide. So, you know, it was what's going to get me out of bed. I mean, there were there was mm-hmm. the, those choices to make. Am I going to just cave into the circumstances 
like a lot of people deal with, you know, we deal with illnesses, we deal with financial loss, we deal with all of this stuff. And, and it's really up to you to find just not to compare myself with Dr. Viktor Frankl, but look what he found mm -hmm. in the most, I mean, unimaginable circumstances. He came out with a book that's been read by millions of people around the world who said, that's it. It's, it's finding purpose. It's finding meaning. So yeah. So how do you help as a leader then? How do you help uh, to motivate the people around you? Because, some, I mean, we live in a terribly cynical society, unfortunately. I mean, this is the, the reality. And people, I don't know, people, it just seems often that people's default position is like, oh, yeah, sounds great. But so how do you how do you instill that hope and use it to motivate the people around you? You know, that's, it's interesting. You just you hit on the line from the great film Jerry Maguire when he said, we live in a cynical world. And it's true. I mean, all you have to do is look at the headlines mm -hmm. every day, uh, pick a country. And we're in this just a strange era. To me, my my medium is communication. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I mean. I cut my teeth work as a professional writer, a communicator, internal, external messages, crisis communication, dealing with all those situations in the studio world, which is not as warm and fuzzy as one might imagine. It's a pretty, uh, it can be a very com a competitive and occasionally cutthroat world. So to me, it's leaders understanding that what you say is heard in multiple ways. So really understanding the customization of your communication. What are you saying? And more important, how are people hearing it? And having a sense of compassion that you don't know what's going on behind the scenes uh, it was interesting. I watched. I went to an interview with Howard Schultz, the founder of uh, Starbucks, last night. And you know, wherever anybody is on the political spectrum, I won't even get into that because you know that's cause for alarm right there. But he was about responsibility. Step up. He said leaders, and particularly those of great wealth, and he is self-made, have an obligation to be responsible, to give back, to pay it forward. And every leader, every manager, and, and when I use the term leader. You know, I'm talking about that entry level file clerk. You have an opportunity to exceed the expectation of the role. And that's real leadership. And then when you're doing things for others, that is servant leadership. Yeah. Well, one, yeah, and, and I agree completely. But one of the things that you find is, uh, is a lot of people, and we've probably all been guilty at different times in our, in our own lives and careers of this, is that sitting back and, I mean, because I like what you said, everybody has an opportunity to take leadership. But there's always that temptation to sit back and sort of say, well, I'll wait to till somebody tells me what to do or till somebody invests in me. And at the end of the day, right, nobody has nobody has your interests at heart greater than you do yourself. Right. So you shouldn't wait around for people. Well, I hope that that's not necessarily true. But yes, of course, we have our own interests at heart. But it's so important to be surrounded with people who are and they can be of all different stripes, but but supportive and loving and cheering you on and applauding your mistakes. I mean, when I wrote my first book, a very wise friend said, and I was nervous and a very wise friend said, look, they're either going to applaud or throw tomatoes mm -hmm. and you can handle it either way. And I thought, you know what? I can handle it either way. And over these 18 years doing what I'm doing in a somewhat public way, there's some of that, you know, you get, and, and it's, why be a bystander? Why wait around? Why not do what you can do in your, whether your corner of the world is that office with your small team or you're running a chunk of the world? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's what a state we've all gotten ourselves into by not being truthful, by not having the courage of our convictions, by not standing up and saying, I'm going to do what I think is right and best for the people I impact. Yeah, I know, and I agree, and and and, and yeah, and the passi the passivity, I think that's part of the thing where we, you know, we've created a world where people tend to be more passive than they need to be, and I think you're absolutely right. But it's hard to lead people if they don't want to be, you know, if they don't want to invest themselves, right? Yeah, and that's where the, the communications piece comes in. It's the best leaders can create this, you know, we love to say now narrative, we create this story, but I think it's more than that. I think if you paint a picture of success that is so visceral and so grand that people look at it and think, wow, I want to be a part of that. And then as a leader, as a manager, as a team member, you connect the dots to 
there's this big, beautiful picture of what this team, this company, this organization, this planet could be. And here's what it means to me and all of you around me. And you bring it down to that level. And, and one term I use all the time in, in coaching is lift as you climb, you know, link arms with people. And every step forward you take, take somebody with you. And it's that difficult and it's that simple. Yeah, well, I, I love that analogy of, of taking somebody with you. Um, so then to your point is that, so as a leader, like it's great if you ha if you have belief and you have a message and it's powerful and all of that, but it has to be able to cycle down through the organization so each person, regardless of where they sit in the organization, can actually relate to it and see how they impact it. Right, and, and one thing I see, I mean, I wouldn't have a coaching practice if people did this way. Yeah, yeah. One thing leaders don't always do, or managers, and, and my distinction is is uh, leaders ask questions and managers answer questions. And that's sort of what it comes down to. But you've got to train the people around you to, to be, to tell the same story, to say, this is mission critical. I mean, if you look at, everybody likes to look at Google or Starbucks or Apple, but but Google's mis mission was so simple, but, but broad, let's codify the information of the world and make it accessible. I mean, can you imagine that? What people must have thought those two were insane to say, we're going to take all the information of the world and organize it. Yeah. But they were able to look at every aspect of the organization and say, does that organize information? Oh, on video, on search, on email. And in fact, it does. And things that didn't do that organization and accessibility kind of fell off. So when we're able to tell that story and excite people with our energy and our passion and our belief, that's when you get them following. Yeah, and it's a fascinating point you make because it's often you see in organizations when you go through a process like that and you say, um, when you look at all the different projects and all the stuff people are working on and then you say, how is that actually uh, contributing to our core mission or whatever our strategic imperatives or whatever it is and you suddenly discover well it's not really and then you're like well why are we doing it you know it's fascinating i spoke at a at a group or, or did a day-long session with a group big organization you would know one of those top 10 and it was their social responsibility group which is great uh, although Howard Schultz made an interesting point last night that it's, it shouldn't be a separate entity. It should be woven into the fiber of your business. And this group, their their corporate responsibility program was women and girls, health, science. I mean, there were so many things. Every Everything that came at them, you know, should we fund this or should we support this? The answer had to be yes. Mm -hmm. So make some really tough decisions about we can't care about every problem in the world because we can't solve all of those. And it's the same in our own businesses. It's pick something that's really important. And I'm forever saying to leaders, pick one, pick two, pick three, no more than that. That's all you can do. Yeah, but because at the end of the day, I mean, we can't, I mean, as I always think, yeah, if you pick a, sometimes if you pick a lot of different initiatives, it means that, you, it, it's, it means that it's almost easier to pick a lot because that way you have get out clauses. If you only pick one or two, you're kind of, you know, you kind of have to be held to the results. Yeah. Look at your backdrop, sales. You know, if something is not about helping people sell their organization, their product, their services, is it really mission critical? Should you be doing it? I mean, that's me. It's it's coaching. It's leadership coaching and consulting comes out in different forms, different levels, speaking, coaching, all these different things. But it's all about taking people where they are and moving them up a notch. Yeah. I noticed that one of the chapters in your book you have is about the generational blend, right? And this is an interesting thing. And and you and it's funny because I catch myself all the time talking about the young people today. And I thought, wow, when did I become that? When did I become old enough to talk about the younger people? But anyway, that's another story. Um, but it's obviously, it's 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 a lot more challenging nowadays because obviously you've got the generational mix. So communicating as a leader, as you said, it's not one message or one approach to every group in the organization or every individual in the organization. Right. And of course, if you're leading 2000 people, mm -hmm. it, maybe you've got 12 direct reports, which is six too many, but you, you can customize for that. You can't customize a message for 2000 people, but you can train your leaders to do that. Now, the challenge with this, this millennial blend 
is and I'm I've got two millennials. I know you've got young children who are in that Gen Z next yeah, Gen week. Z, yeah. Yeah. So one thing is uh, is those of us who are in the boomer and even the traditionalist, you know, upper echelon and in, in terms of age and career stage, forget hanging on to our beliefs and our ways of doing business because we're outnumbered already. You know, millennials are 60% of the workforce in another year or two. So it's not a, we can't paint them all with the same brush. They're not all tech geniuses and they're not all checked out and, and glued to their phones. There is some truism to that because they grew up in an age where they didn't know what a typewriter was or a remote control, you know, or a, it, it, changing channels, which I still remember. Yeah. Um, those things didn't exist. So they've got a different worldview. And our job is to capture it. You know, when, when I talk to older leaders who complain that these entitled millennials, you know, they want to know their purpose. It's, it's yeah, give them a purpose. <laughs> What a high class problem to have. Share that purpose and let them know here's your part in it. And yes, you have to earn your way to leadership. But why would we deny them a sense of, of mission and value and purpose when it's so easy if we can articulate it? And it's also on us. It's no longer you're rearing in the seat from nine to five, which makes us have to be better leaders and communicators and set clearer metrics for success. And so what? That's the obligation of leadership. We should all be doing that anyway. Uh, now we're sort of forced into it because our teams are all over the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we run a very uh, distributed organization ourselves. And I actually think, uh, you know, and I was a late convert to this idea of like remote working and your remote teams because uh, but um nowadays it just makes more sense it allows people to live where they want to live and it you know allows them to have a better balance in their life not waste all that time in commuting or living in high cost areas just to be close to the office and and that way you have access to a, almost a global talent pool plus it gives us extra time which to me is that's the only thing you know, that, that is the true measure of our work is how we spend our time. And if you want to look at what are your values, take a look at your calendar. See where you put chunks of time and energy and effort and money and resources. And and it, it, if we waste that, I mean, you know, L.A. is insane where I live now. The traffic flow has changed direction over the years. I had a meeting four miles away. It was an hour long. It took me 10 minutes to get there, an hour long meeting. It took me 90 minutes to get back. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm converting people slowly to to platforms like this because they don't have to waste their time doing things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one interesting thing, just going back to the generational thing, one interesting thing is that there's research because we do some work with DePaul University and they do a lot of research with um, generations coming into the workforce. And the Generation Z are actually quite different from the millennial generation. So, so I just say to everybody... Don't don't think that once you've uh, figured out the millennials, you've got it sorted. Because guess what, the Z's are different again. <laughs> and and if we embrace the differentness, figure out what their collective strengths are, and play to that, will everyone will work in much better better harmony. And then we've got time left over to solve these bigger problems that you and I just barely touched on. <laughs> exactly. So in the last in the last uh, couple of minutes, uh, first of all, could you say to people how if 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 there was one thing that you could say to people to adopt a more hopeful approach to everything, what would it be? Well, as much as we hear or say hope is is, is hope is not a strategy, I believe the opposite. I think if you offer strategy or resources or tools or even leadership to people who are hope starved, who don't feel that they can follow you, that don't believe in you or even understand the mission, then you're going about it wrong. And I think hope is the strategy that can help smooth the pathway for people to follow along and take advantage of everything that they're offered. Yeah. A wise person once told me that uh, if you're, say you have a, an appointment coming up next Wednesday, right? And uh, between now and next Wednesday, you could do what most of it, most people do, and you could worry about it and think, oh, it's not going to go well. Uh, what happens if this happens, whatever? And um, she said, why don't you just assume that it's a fantastic outcome? And even if it's not, boy, you had a great week in between. <laughs> Absolutely. That's that's my dentist analogy. Are you really going to start worrying about that today when your appointment's on Thursday? Why don't you wait until you walk in the door? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
it, it's it's yeah. assuming good intent and it's assuming a positive outcome and then you just deal with all the fallout in between. Right? Exactly. So before we go, uh, Libby, could you just tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can learn more about you and get in contact with you? I would love that. Uh, they can find me at LibbyGill.com. It's L-I-B-B-Y-G-I-L-L. And in fact, your your listeners, viewers, are, are I'd be happy for them to download a chapter of my book. It's right there on my homepage of my website. Excellent. Well, I highly encourage that. It's Libby, it's been fascinating. I hope you come back again to talk some more because, I, I, like you said, I feel like we only scratched the surface of a lot of different subjects. So again, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. Thanks, Libby, and thank you all for watching and listening. Bye now.